the first two centuries of Jesus movements um, was released in, in November uh, because of um, COVID, my and my co-authors receiving the book has been kind of goofy. Um, uh, in other words, uh, I actually have had since November 35 lectures, and my co-authors also uh, live in uh, some places where they don't have quite that many options to, but um, they have probably both had at least 20 or so together. Because of COVID, um, most of these events were on Zoom in my office in Philadelphia. Uh, I've had lectures in Israel, but it was just in my office. <laughs> I, I think there were about 400 that came to um, uh, to a Zoom uh, event um, uh, in England. Um, I'm not completely sure of the numbers um, uh, for Aaron, Brandon, and me. My two co-authors um, uh, are really... Um, in great places that get special audiences. At any rate, more or less all of these lectures were about the book of after Jesus, before Christianity, until today. So today, in this lecture right now, coming up, um, I've been asked by your leadership uh, to shift the lecture substantially, but not completely. This wish is provided by me. Uh, I was the founding member of the West Star Seminars Jesus Seminar, which uh, was done between 1985 and 2000. And so the request for the third lecture of the weekend it has been asked, is asking me that we might think thoroughly about how to distinguish the first seminar of West Star Institute from the last one. That to look at the, the Jesus seminar and the Christianity seminar. Isn't that a really a neat thing to ask me um, uh, in, in this uh, interesting cross-section? Um, so basically what this means is, although I spent about 15 years making that f uh, with, with 100 seminar members, um, uh, making two books, both of which um, uh, got the New York Times bestseller uh, for um, a good half year. Um, and we got, we got um, all kinds of amazing um, public attention for most of that 15 years, um, especially the last 10. And, and what, what I want to do first is say what, it, what, it, what we actually were supposed to do, and that was to say, this is the, this is the um, not really exact thing I want to say, to say who the real Jesus was. No, it's not that. To say who the historical Jesus was is what we, we hundred scholars were supposed to do in that period. So um, we then took 500 different early documents from the first three centuries that wrote about Jesus. 
And we looked at, all 100 of, the, of us looked at all of those 500 documents, including all the um, parts of the New Testament. So everything um, uh, we looked at, and we looked at, um, as we have, have done with all of our seminars, we look at them thoroughly and try to decipher some specific things about what history was in the first and second century. In that case, we were trying to figure out what Jesus really said and what Jesus really did. I'm sure it doesn't um, make too much problem for you to know that that is a question. That is, is everything we read about Jesus historical? Or um, is some of it not his historical? Or all of it not historical? Um, the results of that work put on display all around the world was that of those 500 documents that wrote in the first several centuries about Jesus, about 16% of what um, was written we deemed to be probably historically accurate in terms of what Jesus said. For the same question of what did Jesus do after looking at the same 500 documents, um, uh, uh, we decided and we, we, we all hundred took votes on every single document and every single sentence in every document. Uh, so it was a, a vote on what we thought was best. We hardly ever um, agreed on everything. Um, there we, we voted 17% of that which was written about what Jesus did we deemed to be historical. Uh, all of the hubbub about that was that um, basically most of what was written was not historical. And that got us in lots of trouble into interesting conversations and the like. It was clear to me and I think to most of my colleagues is that um, as I said yesterday, I lie a lot. Um, that is, you can't have a historian really know that from so far back, from across so much different cultures and the like. So in other words, we were trying to do something that was very difficult. When I look up at, at it uh, in hindsight, I think we did sort of a good job sometime. I'm not sure if we could do any better. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I, we, we probably could do worse. Um, so the interesting thing about this project, one called the Five Gospels, uh, uh, which w uh, especially paid um, homage to the Gospel of Thomas because we used it so much because it was only sayings of, of Jesus um, or the acts of Jesus. Uh, these um, have been read a lot uh, and I would want to say that if I could speak for all of my colleagues that are biblical scholars, um, it seems to me that the, by and large, the attention to this question uh, is no longer very strong. Uh, so that um, we tried to, our best and, um, our, and our fellow scholars who didn't do it also paid us in most cases, quite a bit of attention. And um, we got quite a bit of critique, as well as quite a bit of praise. There are, uh, is a minority of the public 
that's still interested in this question and still reads this, this material. I don't know of, I don't think I know, no, I know several scholars in the entire United States who still work on this um, strongly. Um, I don't think that that, that that certainly is a kind of judgment. Um, uh, and at the same time, it seems to me like um, many people have learned uh, a lot of good things about it. I want to show you um, a couple of aspects of, um, of what we did um, in, when we found what we thought Jesus said and Jesus did. So we're going to, I'd like us to, to look at um, I think the next oh no let's get no more meals for us now. So here is a list of what we call um, the, uh, some of what we call the red sayings, meaning Jesus said it. Uh, um, and these are the most highly voted ones that we thought um, were, were really said by Jesus. There are 503 sayings of Jesus. Uh, uh, we um, didn't find a lot, but these are the most high in the in the ones that were um, uh, said that we thought that would happen. I just want to say a couple of things about this process before we go into the the um, uh, actual sayings. So, in the new. Testament, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, and you want to find out what the very, the, er, the, the documents from the first several centuries say, you need to know that um, there, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have probably between 40 and 150 different copies of the manuscript, and none of them agree. So one of the main things we had to do is for every verse, we had to look at it um, and see the differences in the, each, of the, the, um, e each of the sayings. Uh, similarly, some of, some of those versions have much of it missing. So some of the, the documents are so damaged that you can't see a bunch of it. So in other words, what occurred to many of us many times is, I wonder if my, uh, my opinion would be different if there wasn't a big hole in it. Um, secondly um, is, um, in many of these sayings, um, there was so much difference in what they meant. So one of the main things we did is try to look at which, what, which exact meaning or exact sayings are the most alike. So we would just parse them and to figure out what would what was seemed to be uh, a common thread. Similarly, if a text was uh, only dated from, let's say, the 13th century, we would not give it as much um, support as if it were from the third century. We did not know there's only one or two documents of, uh, of, a, of a phrase or two that are from the first century. So most of it is copy of copy of copy of copy. So there was no original anything. We just tried to do our best in thinking through 
How can we see the, the closest to Jesus? Other interesting question is the whole circumstances of Jesus. How much do we know? Why do we know? Why we, do we not know? For instance, we, as a hundred scholars, voted that we didn't think Jesus could read or write. There are only two places in the, um, the, the New Testament where there's Jesus writing and one part is in the dust. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that one can't think that Jesus taught and taught these things. But then you, you have to ask the question, who brings it to you and under what circumstances? So let's look at this. Here the, uh, are the, are they 10? I don't, I don't know whether I counted 10. Love your enemies, from Luke. When someone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other as well. When someone takes away your coat, coat don't prevent that person from taking your shirt along with it. Luke. Give to anyone who begs from you. Luke. Congratulations, you poor. God's domain belongs to you. Congratulations, you hungry. You will have a feast. Congratulations, you who weep now. You will laugh. Luke. What does God's imperial rule remind you of? It is like leaven, which a woman took and concealed in 50 pounds of flour until it was all leavened. Luke. Give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. Give God what belongs to God. Gospel of Thomas. There was a man going from Jerusalem down to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Now, by coincidence, a priest was going down the road. When he caught sight of him, he went out of his way to avoid him. In the same way, when a Levite came to the place, he took one look at him and crossed the road to avoid him. But the Samaritan who was traveling that way, came to where he was and was moved to pity at the sight of him. He went up to him and bandaged his wounds, powering, pouring olive oil and wine on him, and came to where he was, oh no, and, and wine on him. He hosted him onto his own animal, brought him to an inn, and looked after him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, which he gave to the innkeeper and said, look up after him, and on my way back, I'll re reimburse him for any extra expense you have had. Luke. Tell me about the heaven's imperial, what the heaven's imperial rule is like, the, um, the student says. It is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it falls on prepared soil, it produces a large plant and becomes a shelter for birds of the sky. Gospel of Thomas. Um, just to, to say one thing about the way we went through this, by and large, none of us we're looking for the, the best thing Jesus said. Our only question was supposed to be historical. I, for instance, n there were a lot of things that I wish I could have voted because I liked it better. But what, I, what we were supposed to do all together was simply find the closest to the, the historical Jesus as possible. Let's go one more down to what did Jesus say. Here's some of the things that are at the top of the list for 
what we voted in on what Jesus did. Some who saw Jesus thought he was mad. This is a, all of these are texts. And we said that probably happened. That some people thought Jesus was mad. That's in the Bible. Um, and um, um, we voted yes. We think that happened. Some who saw Jesus thought he was an agent of Beelzebul. We thought that happened. Jesus was an itinerant teacher in Galilee. We thought that happened. Jesus taught in the synagogue of Galilee. We said that happened. Jesus proclaimed the domain of God. Jesus cured some sick people. Jesus drove out what were thought to be demons. Jesus enjoyed a certain amount of popularity in Galilee and surrounding regions. Jesus practiced prayer in seclusion. Jesus consorted openly with social outcasts. One label for social outcast was toll collectors and sinners. Jesus was criticized for eating with social outcasts. Jesus justified his practice of sharing open table in aphorism and parable. There were a, a few more. If something was voted red, um, we thought pretty sure that it had happened or Jesus said it. If it was pink, we were less sure. If it was gray, we were thinking maybe not. And if it was um, black, we thought, no, that didn't happen. So that was our color code um, to try to make this. This is only red um, um, votes. Um, so I, um, so this is what I'm reporting to you on. Um, I hope you have some questions when we have the questions which will come pretty soon. Um, and I wanted to say just a few words about the uh, book that just came out um, and ask questions about how much the work was similar uh, and wh what was it like. Um, one of the interesting things is that our seminar, we could only find um, 20 people to work for 10 years. Whereas this group found 100 um, to work for 15. Um, so that was interesting. I don't quite know how to say, um, uh, provide any other thoughts about it. Um, uh, we, oh, it, the, oh the, the people who did the, the project about what did Jesus say and do had 98 men and two women in it. Uh, we had uh, for um, after Jesus, before Christianity, we had 10 women and 10 men. Um, So far, it looks like um, um, people are getting less mad at what we say about the first 200 years than about what Jesus said or did. That's kind of clearly a reason, right? Because ours was the, the first Jesus thing was simply um, more contestable and, and important for, for, for people. Um, I want to show you uh, one thing that we did in this present book, which is on here as well. These are this, what we, as the three writers of the 20 seminar members, they were the, the last three that we talked about um, yet yesterday, um, we, the, the seminar about what were the first two, 200 years like in the Jesus movements. In, in that regard, um, um, we uh, had, 
we decided that there were so many surprises to us. We asked ourselves, what was the six biggest um, uh, discoveries that w we did in those 10 years? And just to remind you what I said yesterday, the main reason we were able to make such headway was not because we were so smart. It was to be because in the previous 30 years, for some reason, biblical scholarship was better. Simply a lot more smart people that we got to write and think about with. Um, so here are the six major discoveries about Jesus' peoples um, in the first two centuries. They resisted the Roman Empire. A widespread of what we call Jesus clubs, movements of the Savior, communities of the anointed, and schools of the Lord successfully resisted the Roman Empire. Um, I have more to that, but I um, ran out of space here. Um, the second major discovery that we just got finished thinking our first round with, they practice gender bending. Here I have a little bit more uh, explanation on what the three authors said. A wide range of Jesus people practiced gender bending. That is, gender roles were fluid and flexible. One of their primary identities was that they were neither male nor female. That's said a number of times in the New Testament among other places, but were one the, through different lived experience to realities of gender pluralism. Women and a significant number of men rejected both male dominance and female passivity. A wide swath of Jesus groups rejected marriage and traditional families, with the envoy Paul often leading the way. Although some anointed groups and individuals supported male dominance and demanded obedience to men and women, many men shifted toward acting more vulnerable and less domineering. Women cut their hair and dressed like men. These gendered activities and actions brokered new possibilities for identity among various peoples, well beyond the regular masculine-feminine dichotomies of the first, century, first two centuries. Third discovery, they lived in chosen families. Let me say a little bit about that um, uh, more. And that was that, uh, that a number, well, we saw that in, in Thecla. That is, there were Jesus people who built families together that weren't um, of the same bloodline, but were chosen families. They, four, they claimed belonging to Israel. This is really also um, stunning, um, uh, we thought, because uh, basically most of the people that claimed uh, uh, to be a part of the people of Israel, they also did not have mother or father that were um, uh, that bloodline. So there were a lot of people in different groups who, to a certain extent, one might say, um, knew that Jesus was a member of the people of Israel, and so they might go that way too. Probably more to the case, people who were in small groups but were not uh, technically in the people of Israel, they found um, courage in the people of Israel, and they found it um, to have good uh, ways of thinking about God and good ways of thinking about um, human ethics. Five, they had diverse organizational structures. That means um, uh, that we were very surprised that nobody was in charge for 200 years. There was nobody up front 
in charge saying, hey, everybody do this, or everybody do that, or why don't you do this? Um, uh, uh, there was nothing like that. That's probably also because people thought a lot about them being part of the people of Israel. And the people of Israel at that time also did not have a, uh, a big leader, partly because Rome had taken it away and partly because they liked to trust one another in different groups. Sixth discovery, they had persisting oral traditions. I said a little bit about that um, yesterday, uh, and it's basically because about, we think, about 90 to 95 percent of the people in the first and second centuries could not read or write. Um, so, um, and it was and it's quite clear from what was written down or what was said um, that um, uh, these people who had these thoughts probably couldn't write or, or, or read. So it's a long way to even get it to paper or papyrus. So anyway, that is um, um, a, a comparison of the two projects. And, and one of the things that I notice about it that I had never noticed until your assignment, um, and that was um, that these six discoveries are not very far away from what we uh, said about what Jesus did and said. So if you look at this, um, it's quite clear that the first Jesus people um, um, resisted Rome. Um, uh, Jesus, for instance, one, this, is, I, this is one of the complicated ones. When, when in, the, in the text you have people coming to Jesus and saying, should we pay taxes or not? Jesus dodges the question. But that is a kind of resistance. Um, uh, and we read la yesterday uh, about a whole bunch of texts in the Gospel of Luke where the Gospel of Luke was trying to tell them what, to, what they um, uh, should do when a soldier came up to them and tried to force them to do something. And that was mostly just pretty Pretty, um, the, Luke was trying to um, make a way for people not to get in trouble and maybe not do wrong. Um, they practiced gender bending. Um, we, I guess I would already say um, that since Paul um, uh, was against marriage and um, was um, saying um, uh, that uh, others should be also it, um, uh, that in the first century, in the, in the Jesus people, there were people almost certainly like that. Um, Paul is probably a little bit after that. They lived in chosen families. That in and of itself, in as much as one th thinks that the um, 12 disciples or 12 students were real people? That's an interesting question. Um, but if it were, they were chosen family. Um, they claimed belonging to Israel, almost certainly, that the first um, people in Jesus' generation all thought they, that they should uh, obey the uh, God of Israel. Five, they had diverse organizational structures. It's not clear that um, there were many structures at all in the initial Jesus people. Um, uh, and um, so that looks somewhat the same. Um, they, they had persisting oral traditions. It's, again, most, most everybody, uh, uh, scholarly-wise, says that all of the young students following Jesus couldn't read or write. 
some students, right? In other words, but a lot of groups of students did that by talking to each other. Um, I think I, uh, we do have some, from the first lecture, some things that you might want to think about. That would be, first of all, uh, Thecla, and second of all, um, um, uh, eating together. I, I want to just put the question, assess questions or thoughts about eating together um, um, uh, strongly uh, that if, if I was talking in this room with a, um, with a group of Episcopalians um, and said, hey, why don't we go lie down together and drink and eat and talk for a long time every week, um, I wouldn't get much uh, success, would I? Um, <laughs> I, in, in my seminary, when I taught all of this stuff, they would always join together, but that was hilarious. Um, okay, um, so let's, um, do you have any um, thoughts, uh, Steve, on how to, to begin our discussion together? I, I have a microphone, and I'll bring it to you. And, and we have John back there who's going to bring us also some questions probably from Jan. This is for the benefit of both uh, us here and also for the people that are live streaming. They reported that they could not, they could not hear the questions. So I'll bring it to you. And please ask more than questions. Uh, please ask disputes um, or have disputes and just thoughts as well. This is just a question. Okay. <laughs> On the Jesus seminar, when the voting was happening, is this uh, the red statements? Were those a majority or were they a unanimous or was it 75%? Oh, yeah. What was your, what was your policy? Thank there? you. Um, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was neither of the above. It was a, technical mostly and it had to be with the number of people who voted on a particular thing then they I don't remember what the the um, exactly it was but it was usually between 50 and 100 um, I'm curious about the affirmation of the Jesus people as being, quote, part of Israel. Or, and in my study and, and the way I was taught, it's almost a kind of a binary thing, Jew and Gentile. And the Jerusalem Conference was an attempt to kind of come together on that, and it seemed to resolve the issue by saying that you really didn't have to be very Jewish <laughs> to follow Jesus. You could do the however many four or five uh, compromise rules, but that didn't seem like really being Jewish or following Israel. I mean, you didn't eat blood and you didn't eat meat sacrificed to uh, altars and so forth. But, but to what extent did they really, were these people of Greek origin who identified with Israel? Did they keep kosher? Did they, you know, what, 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 what did that look like? I mean, Peter going to Cornelius seemed to be a pretty sharp, you know, distinction saying, you know, I'm, I've got to give up my Jewishness <laughs> or my Jewish perspective in order to meet Cornelius where he is. And, and I'm not trying to make Cornelius into a Jew. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that dichotomy. Yeah, I, I'd love to, and it's a great question. Um, and I... I think there is a fairly clear answer. Um, I th and the clear answer is to know that Israel itself was stunningly diverse, did not have clear uh, people who ruled over anything. Um, and then here's the biggest thing. Most of the people of Israel in the first and second century did not live in Israel. 
And that had a lot to do with Rome, who were chasing them out, with other empires that were before then. Um, and so for instance, when, when you would look at, we know that the, most of the people who were people of Israel were not in Israel. They could be in, in Spain or uh, North Africa or all of these. The, the stunning things about that is that a good portion of, of Hebrew scripture is impossible in those situations. So in other words, much of what, what um, matters to um, uh, the people of Israel in that time, they can't agree on in those times. And, and so you had stunning amounts of tolerance for one another, partly because um, under Rome, so much could turn into you, you're getting killed really easily. And so you had beautiful tolerance um, of, of people in Jerusalem with people in, let's say, uh, Syria. Um, uh, uh, they knew they couldn't, I mean, after a while, of course, there wasn't even a temple to, to get to. But when there was, there was all kinds of saying, could you work something else out? Um, and, 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 and that, and then you have the rabbinic period um, beginning in the second century. And there, um, there's no longer a temple. And they're mostly people that are not in Israel. And what r the rabbinic movement as it starts does is to, to take really seriously that th so many things have to change for us just to survive. And there's lots. One of the main things that one does rabbinically is how do you dis how do you uh, work on a problem? And, you, and, and so there's so much rabbinical texts that um, say, OK, if you're arguing about this, this is um, how you proceed in arguing it. Um, and, 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 and it's always very kind. Um, so, so in other words, I don't even get to the good part of your question because, but the people of Israel are in such um, lack of strength uh, about who they are joined together, and they, and they are actually, in to a certain extent, really glad in many cases that they got out of Israel because it was more dangerous. So there was a lot of, of give and take and, and tolerating people. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because they, those are rabbinics. <laughs> they're, they're starting, they're still doing it. Yeah, beautiful description. Next. I'm a... Uh... I'm just a poor country boy from Pendleton, but uh, I went to Clemson and graduated. I did okay there, but it didn't. It took me about six years to get out. But anyway, make a long story short, you're a remarkable person. Because I don't know of anybody I've heard that's any smarter than you. You make me cry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Everybody knows what you know. You need these hands shook. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Nobody's online right now. Um, when you say gender bending, I'm thinking a lot of people are thrown off because of the modern context that term has. Um, it sounds like to me, if I'm hearing this right, they rejected traditional roles of leadership and submissiveness. It's not necessarily what we see on RuPaul's Drag Race. 
You know what I mean? In today's society, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, sure. but I think the term is, means something else in today's society than what you mm. intended it to mean. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a beautiful point. And, um, and I want to um, have a couple of things um, for us to think together about. Um, so what about there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in uh, and some of those texts uh, go differently, but basically they're all one in Christ. And, and clearly in the, in the text you have, for instance, um, who is Christ? Christ is very regularly Sophia. In other words, you have actively in the New Testament um, active saying, um, who is Christ? Um, Christ is uh, the divine female, the, the divine female um, uh, wisdom. Uh, so, so I guess that's my, my first question of myself is, um, uh, I think they mean it. <laughs> In other words, I think they're really smart about um, uh, what... what um, what you need to manage um, gender relationships in that time. So for instance, if you look at the way um, Greek and, and Roman people think about gender, there are, there are at least 10 different genders that they know about. And that they know to practice if they some, some do. So, um, f yes, for sure, it's not like what we're doing. It is probably what a bunch of us are doing helps us when we read our texts. We read them differently now. There's, there's so much of a, a binariness in the way we think about things, is it woman or man? Um, and I think that um, the texts are just ripe with more than, than that. But they don't have the same options as, as, as we, in all cases. In some cases, they do. Let me ask a follow-up on that. All right, McConnell. Um, now, I just lost my th train of thought. Um, I may come back to it later. Okay. All Good. right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, by the way, for getting us into this because um, uh, it feels to me like when I mean when I was um, gutsy enough to ask you all whether you knew Thecla, and it turned out that some people did, um, but had kind of forgotten it or almost. Um, um, uh, when we dis just saying that. Um, was um, um, that you all raised your hands was wonderful. Um, and I was, I was kind of thinking, what's going to happen next if you haven't had much um, conversation with this pretty big piece of, of document? Let me ask a very general question and I'm applying it to what you talked about yesterday as well as what you talked about today. Um, I'm wondering about the extent to which many of these things reflect the Greco-Roman pagan culture in which the Jesus movements grew up. It's a two-way street. Uh, the first thing that made me think of this was the the, just the, the meals, uh, the reclining at the table, made me think of a Greek symposium. But it goes also to the, the very texts that you've been looking at. I think of John 1, the, very, the way John's gospel begins. It's, it has echoes of Heraclitus. Mm. And then you have Augustine coming along and saying that uh, when he read the books of the Platonists, he found in exactly these words 
uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word yeah. was, you know, the, the text that he, uh, that of course as a Christian writing, looking back on his life, he knew, he knew where he recognized that yeah. from. So I'm curious to know, uh, it did not, my, my point is it could not possibly have grown up in total isolation. These influences, uh, even in the first two centuries, especially in the first two centuries, have to creep in in places. Yeah. I'm just curious to know which, if you saw and paid attention to those kinds of things. Yeah, I, the, I'm just thrilled to, to say yes in as many ways as possible to your question. Um, but just let me try that out. So for instance, one of the things that happened about the meals is that uh, basically we have documents from the, the um, the, the faith of the people of, of um, uh, Israel saying, this is the way you have a meal. And it's, and it's a Greco-Roman one. Uh, one of the other things is that it looks like, for instance, that the Seder uh, the, um, of, of our day, is, it, it's, got, it's got Greek and Roman vocabulary in it. Um, so the directions for, for the, that go back all the way um, to Israel, um, t it turns out that when they got around to making that more um, clear, they were writing Greek and they were acting Greek in all kinds of ways. And, and then you have colonialism. <laughs> in other words, um, Israel was, uh, um, colonialism is almost a nice word <laughs> to what, what the people of Israel had to do just to get, get along. Um, so, but that goes two ways. So for instance, um, by and large, I'm probably getting too excited. Um, um, when, when you get um, into uh, the idea of, of what, um, um, what you can do, um, uh, you have to um, obey the people that are ruling. Colonialism is you've got you've got the colonials down and it's okay, but this was much more uh, scary um, um, for 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 how you how you how you do it. So that's the beginning, yeah. But I I I, I would say that by the end of the third century. There's a new kind of re rebellion, both by uh, the people of Israel and the people of Christianity. <clears throat> How yesterday you described yourself as a Christian, mm -hmm. and you said you had a few years where you went away from that description. So I'm curious what, what the word itself means to you and how, how you would describe yourself as a Christian, and then as a slight follow-up to that, what, what your simple, if you can, definition of, of what your image of, of God is, this, this word that we use as, as God, you know, just, you know, yeah, just, just that, yeah, just, just that, that. yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, um, remind me of the second question, because the first one is as interesting and wonderful enough to ask, thanks for asking that. Um, I think the first thing to say about me, which doesn't matter, I mean, I, I don't care um, to a certain extent, but um, I would have to say what I did even when I was in the depth of that other question, I, I would have to say that you, you could not s squeeze the Christian out of me if I wanted, for better or for worse. So, for instance, there are a lot of ways in which I know that what I think of as what I would think as Christian behavior, good Christian behavior, 
I, in many cases, um, don't like. And know that I wouldn't stop doing it just because that's the way I am. So in other words, on, is, on that basic level, it's just a, an a honesty with myself. Um, in other words, I, I think that people who are trying to get outside of Christianity because they've been damaged so much by Christianity, um, I wish them the best. I want them not to be Christians because it will be better for them. I'm not that. I'm a, a person who, when I, um, I know that sometimes I'm inherently acting Christian in ways that don't make me a better person. But I can't catch up with myself. Sometimes I can, but a lot of times I can't. So I want to be honest with the, the, the kind of character I am. And that is sometimes doing bad things um, for reasons that I just can't catch up with. And especially for me not being able to think well enough about my own Christianity all the time. The second thing is, um, of the many things that Christians make me, Christian Christianity makes me do are some really wonderful things. So I would say, um, even all the way back to um, um, Jesus and Paul, the way they jumped into being vulnerable as a man um, uh, is amazing. And I think there's a lot of things in, in Jesus and in Paul's behavior that I don't even think about anymore that it's Christian, but I do it, and, and it saves me from being a worse person. Um, so vulnerability for me is, is a, a, something going on in the first century with the very first Jesus people. And, and they're, they're thinking really hard about how um, they can be damaged more by them um, hurting other people in their family and hurting other people in their, in their neighborhood. Now, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, no, the other thing that was sort of what I like, uh, said yesterday, I think it's um, Christianity um, is in such a mess um, nationally and worldwide, it's got to, people have got to throw themselves into it and be their best person. And, and that could be eventually fleeing from Christianity, but I don't, I, I don't think it's time. A lot of us need to throw ourselves at really hard questions and be as authentically Christian as we can be. Um, and g g get, all, get as much, um, get as much authenticity as we can in being that kind of Christian that wants a better world, wants better people, and wants love and care of each other. Um, now, there are, I know there are a bunch of people in other places listening to us now, and there are people in this room that are listening to me um, um, try to do my best on this question. Um, and I want to say again, um, it is clear to me that some of the people I love most in all kinds of places that are Christian should get the hell out of it because they can't. They, they, they're too terrible of people unless they do. Just because I don't think I am doesn't mean I don't know that there are so many people that should leave Christianity for something better spiritually. And, and again, I'm, I'm assuming there's one or five in the room now. 
and way more in those other rooms. But I'm in the process, you know, I'm, a, I'm still a sort of a, a clergy person. I love throwing myself into this bigger situation um, in our world where I'm, I'm making Christians. I'm, I'm doing an active, a whole bunch of active work that ha people are coming to me from outside Christianity all the time and saying, what you're making is drawing, I'm, is, I'm drawn to that. And, and um, that's not because I'm any great shakes. It's because I try to have real conversation and I happen to be in, in this part of being a Bible scholar that I'm mostly concentrating on the 150 new things that we've discovered in the last um, 150 years and some of it turns out to be stunning. <coughs> I have all the time people from all around the country saying to me, I just read about what you said about this document that I don't even know. And I want to read it, and I, and I understand that it's, it's part of a larger Jesus thing that's going on in stuff that we haven't read. I mean, we, that happened today, right? That happened with Thecla today. And... I, wanna, I want people to know about Thecla and learn from her. Hal, may I refer to the last slide that you had up on the screen where you had the six discoveries, the, the six surprises. The first one was that there was a diversity of what you called Jesus peoples. And then the, the sixth one was that they had oral traditions. So the simple question is, which... Uh, to simple p people who want simple answers, but you can give, I'm sure, a, a non-simple answer to it, but were they, the oral traditions of the diverse peoples, the same oral traditions? That is, were they telling the same stories about the same man, or the same men, or the same women? Were they the same oral traditions? Diverse, diverse groups, oral traditions. Were they different or the same? Steve, make sure that I'm answering the right question. Um, I'm not sure I, I understand. Okay, the, the but, number but no, six. Let me try. The, the, the sixth surprising discovery was that they were having, they, they told oral traditions. Right. Not writing, reading and writing, but telling oral traditions. Were the oral traditions the same in the diverse Jesus people's groups? No. All, so they did all sorts. They might have been telling about Jesus. They might have been telling about Thecla. They might have been telling about Mary or whoever. So there was no there common is, oral traditions. There's hardly any um, continuity and sameness in the larger Jesus phenomenon. And let me say what I said sometime in the last six weeks. Um, hours. Um, so, so the person who first says, hey, let's have, let's, of, of the 20 some uh, gospels we know, let's have four of them. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Somebody said that at the end of the second century. And um, then added why he wanted four different ones. And the answer was, there are four winds that blow and four corners to the earth. In other words, the person who first said, let's have four um, gospels, picked them because they all would be different. There would be four winds that blow and four corners of the earth would be in it if you had them. In other words, he wasn't looking for sameness. So there, this, this was a pretty conservative guy at the end of the second century who said, 
No, what we need most as we start getting our texts is um, having reading different things. So in other words, I want to, if I got your question right, I want to say not only were there all kinds of differences, but there were all kinds of conservative people who said that would be good if there were differences. Am I, am I close to your question? Very good. Uh, you want to express your appreciation to Hal, and then Jim is going to get him in the corner. Everywhere Jim, one of our board members, goes, he asks, who is God? So he is a pilgrim. Oh, that's right. Oh, and you, you I, didn't, I didn't even answer your second question. No, but we're, we're going to close it now so that people will feel free to leave, but you're free to stay as well. But I, uh, and let us just say we're going to do an experiment, another new thing in September, September the 18th, Sunday afternoon. We're going to present as a forum a board presentation, a moderated discussion where we talk about the way in which people evolve spiritually, the way in which people's minds change and what it is that causes the minds to change. And we're going to have four or five members of the board to sit at a table and to talk about that and present that as a way of confirming the necessity and the legitimacy of the way people change their minds. Uh, please express your appreciation to Hal. And to Mary, Mary and John of Grace Episcopal Church, thank you for your wonderful hospitality to us today. And if I may only um, uh, uh, thank you all for um, being here, for doing the work you're doing um, for all this long time. Um, and some of you are new, um, but um, I'm really glad I came down from um, the Northeast to be in South Carolina.